three weeks of data at our disposal, we can start to make even more informed week-to-week -week decisions. Today, we are continuing our love-hate series, where I point out three guys I'm trying to start everywhere and three players I'm trying to sit everywhere. But before we dig in, head over to 444.com, use promo code YouTube, get yourself 25% off any subscription plan. Start Khalil Shakir. The Bills' offensive tackle tandem of Spencer Brown and Deion Dawkins has been nearly perfect through three weeks of action, allowing a combined five pressures and zero quarterback hits. The rest of the line has also been just as fantastic, with a league-leading 2.7% adjusted sack rate and a league-low 0.842% blown block rate. While Allen has been spreading the ball out pretty thinly behind this incredible protection, Khalil Shakir has been thriving in an increased role out of the slot, notching a 14 reception, 168 receiving yard, two touchdown stat line, and the team's three wins. Even if the Baltimore Ravens get more pressures than we expect, Shakir can operate as a quick hitting option and pad our fantasy box scores as an underneath option. Dalton Kincaid also fits this bill here, and although he found the end zone last week, we might see his first truly great performance of the 2024 season as we look for him to finally top the 50-yard mark. Fire up Shakir as a high floor option, but keep in mind that he had three games of 90-plus yards in the second half of last season while sharing the field with Stephon Diggs. There's a good chance that a boom week is coming sooner rather than later. Start Devin Singletary. I was admittedly too low on Singletary during the fantasy draft cycle with the belief that he didn't have the talent to fend off the backups, even if they weren't particularly good enough to force the Giants' hand. Instead, what has emerged as a complete Singletary takeover, with him seeing 73.9% of the offensive snaps through three games, the ninth highest mark in the league. These aren't empty production snaps either, as he saw 15 opportunities in week one, 17 in week two, and 20 this last week. The thought that fifth-round rookie and former wide receiver Tyrone Tracy might shoulder his way into a majority of the third downs has been mostly unfounded, as he only has three receptions for 22 yards on the season, or less than Singletary racked up in Week 3 alone. While I do believe Tracy has an interesting stash in deeper leagues, as he could eventually earn more, of, more work as the season goes on, it's happening a little too gradually for my liking. This week, the Giants take on division rival Cowboys, who gave up who have given up 36.1 schedule-adjusted fantasy points to the running back position, by far the most in the league to this point. The gap between the Cowboys and the 31st-ranked Raiders, who have allowed 28.7 schedule-adjusted points, is the same distance between the Raiders and the Cincinnati Bengals, who ranked 19th. Devin Singletary isn't the most exciting back, but the volume he's earning right now makes him a great bet for an RB2 finish. Start Jaden Reed. It looks like Jordan Love is on track to start week four, and if he's out there, we should see a return to an explosive passing attack. Though the offense was more than serviceable with Malik Willis at the helm, the team had only 43 dropbacks in the past two games combined, leading to 325 total yards passing and only one option in each game hitting over 50 receiving yards. Reed was able to haul in six of his eight targets over the last couple of weeks, but they mounted to 59 yards with an average depth of target that was literally in the negatives. With Love back out there, We'll see the ball being pushed down the field more often, and we can pick back up where we left off in week one when Reed had a 17.5 ADOT, including a 70-yard bomb that went for a touchdown. On top of the boost and big play opportunities, Reed should also simply see the field more often. While Willis was on the field, the team understandably opted to run the ball more often, resulting in far more 12 personnel sets. This comes at a huge disadvantage for the wide receiver, as his 5'11", 185-pound frame isn't the optimal body type when you're either running the ball or trying to make the defense think you're running the ball. Reed's snaps subsequently fell from 48 in Week 1, 39 in Week 2, and 36 in Week 3. If Love is back out there, we can safely stick Reed back in our lineups as a wide receiver 2 option. Sit Michael Pittman. Ever since that Week 1 game in which Anthony Richardson was bombing the ball 60-70 to 70 yards down the field, we've seen the other side of the coin. In the two games since then, he has thrown for 371 yards, one touchdown and five interceptions. He's also lost a couple of fumbles in the process as he is currently tied with Will Levis for the most giveaways on the season. This mistake-heavy play has come at a huge detriment to his wide receivers as Alec Pierce is the only option to top 50 yards in weeks two or three, and that was his 56-yard performance in week two. As we expected in week three, the return of Josh Downs muddied the waters, most notably for Adonai Mitchell, but Michael Pittman also received a season-low five targets on the season, 
failing to hit 40 yards for the third game in a row. Things should hopefully turn around at some point this season, but Week 4's matchup against the Steelers is not a good scenario to place your bet. Pittsburgh is doing what they can to grind the clock down when they have the ball, and when they've been on defense, they've allowed the league's lowest schedule-adjusted fantasy points to opposing offenses, including the fifth lowest against wide receiver rooms. Not only is Michael Pittman not living up to his wide receiver two draft cost, he can't even be started this week in any but the deepest of leagues. Next week's matchup against the Jacksonville Jaguars should end up being a good bounce back spot. Sit Zamir White. Through three weeks of action, it's been miserable for Zamir White drafters. He's earned 12.3 half PPR points in total with 4.1 points per game. The Raiders are averaging negative 0.51 EPA per rush attempt, which is tied for the worst for any team in weeks one through three over the last two decades. This should give you a scope of how poorly things have been going in the Raiders' run game, and Zamir White is the catalyst. Among 50 qualified running backs, White's 2.22 yards after contact, ranked 49th, is 3.3 yards per carry, ranked 40th, and is .44 yards per route run, ranked 43rd, and he is one of the few select backs who have zero runs of 15 or more yards. This is all across 38 opportunities, so it's not as if it's a small sample size in the grand scheme of things. We've been talking about how Zamir White's situation is not one to target in fantasy for weeks now, and things are even worse than we thought they could be. In week three, he finished third on the team in running back snaps behind both Alexander Madison and veteran Amir Abdullah. Out of 45 dropbacks with a tandem of Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell, he ran four outs with zero targets, while Madison and Abdullah ran 19 apiece, earning five looks as receivers. Over the course of their week three loss to the Carolina Panthers, White missed multiple entire drives, and on a team not expected to be blowing anybody out of the water anytime soon, we could see that sort of game script pop up throughout the rest of the season. Sit all Bears running backs. This backfield has been an absolute cluster. It makes you wonder why the team decided to give DeAndre Swift a $24 million contract. Through three weeks of the season, Swift has handled 51.4% of the team's carries and an 8.5% target share, ranking 24th and 33rd, respectively, among all qualifying backs. He may have earned more opportunities if he wasn't sporting a pitiful 1.8 yards per carry and 0.61 yard per route run mark. A downturn in production is something we honestly should have expected moving from Philadelphia at one of the league's annual best offensive lines to a Chicago Bears team that has struggled in that department for the better parts of the last half decade. But 1.8 yards per carry is something that no one could have expected. While that metric should presumably improve as the season moves on, the team has already started to rotate Roshan Johnson in. He had eight carries to Swift's 13 last week and saw four targets to Swift's three. Diving even deeper, Johnson saw 10 third down snaps to Swift's one, and Khalil Herbert looks to be the team's goal line back. It's a miserable situation, and it won't take much longer to think about dropping all of these guys in shallow leagues. For now, bench Swift, Roshan, and Herbert, and let this murky backfield clear up before we make our next move.